Hey there, Space Fam. We're back for another episode of Today in Space. We need to review SpaceX's historic success of Starship's Flight Test 5, which happened just this past Sunday on October 13th, 2024. They made the impossible possible and gave us a glimpse at what our future looks like going back to the moon and on to Mars in possibly 2026 and then beyond in the future of human space travel. So let's dive in. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to Today in Space. folks as always i am your space science podcast host from the east coast alex g orfanos and we're going to start with doing a quick lightning round of all the space facts that we gathered here of this insane test flight first make sure that you're following us on social media today in space pod on instagram on twitter slash x we are also today in space on tiktok and then our facebook page at today in space podcast you can always email us at today in space podcast at gmail.com don't forget to hit subscribe that's the best way and click that bell so that you get every update but let's go into the lightning round starship successfully launched from spacex's starbase in texas and powered all 33 raptor engines on the super heavy booster to send starship into orbit the fuel for the starship system is liquid oxygen and methane which explains why the plumes of thrust were blue the hot stage separation went flawless. That's when Starship's engines light before it separates from the heavy booster, which was sending it to space. And that helps that super massive heavy rocket system do its separation successful. And we even got a view of the hot stage ring floating away from super heavy booster on the return, which was cool. For the first time ever, SpaceX managed to catch the massive Super Heavy booster mid-air on the pad using their giant launch pad called Mechazilla, using massive mechanical arms called the chopsticks. Starship and the Super Heavy booster were loaded with 4,500 metric tons, or 10 million pounds, of propellant. Starship, fully stacked, sits at 397 feet tall. The Starship Heavy booster alone is 23 stories tall, and returned to the pad at half the speed of sound before the boosters relit to slow it down for landing at the pad, with Mechazilla there to catch it. 33 Raptor engines are designed to generate 16 million pounds of force, while Starship itself generates almost 3 million pounds of force. And SpaceX has performed 352 successful recoveries of their Falcon 9 rocket to date before this October 13th mission, and we expect to see even higher launch rates for Starship moving forward, which is kind of bananas to think about, but this last test makes all of that closer to reality than it was before. And there's only five years between the launch of Starhopper, aka Hopper, and its first hop to Starship's heavy boosters first catch with Mechazilla. It's amazing to think what they've accomplished in five years, and it hasn't been easy, but five years ago we were talking about the possibility of all this happening and them taking this starship and running it through the test like they did with the falcon 9 and we know how fast things accelerated once they were able to land their first falcon 9 booster and we're at this point now with starship and their heavy booster on launch day october 13th 2024 spacex was prepared to launch as soon as they could get regulatory approval from the faa which happened to come in officially the night before so as far as people planning for this this happened very quickly and anyone who was willing to take the risk that the faa would give them that license as soon as spacex put the october 13th date out into the ether they definitely were able to have the seat of a lifetime to go watch this launch. We were un unable to go, but we'll talk about that in just a second. 
Even before T-Zero of launch, there were boats in the surrounding areas that needed to be cleared before they could launch. And this is not anything new with space travel and launching rockets. Boats in the designated areas can always stop a launch. And we've seen that happen before with a SpaceX launch. But as we heard on the broadcast, they managed to get things clear around two minutes before launch. And without pause, Starship took off for its fifth flight test once it hit T-Zero. During launch... It still wasn't clear if the landing would happen back on the pad or if they would go off the coast and in the middle of the ocean. But after Mechazilla pulled goal for catch after launch, Super Heavy was programmed to do a boost back burn to go back to the pad after Starship and the booster had successfully done its hot fire stage separation on its way to orbit. And since Starship had been developed over six years, so many things have changed. And one thing that I completely forgot about, and someone in the comments reminded me of, is how the booster is actually caught. And so here's a great chance to talk about that, me to do a little bit of learning, and talk about how the Super Heavy Booster was caught with the chopsticks of Mechazilla. And there are two comparably small lifting lugs that are located just a bit lower from the grid fins that are used to maneuver the booster through the atmosphere. And I thought I remembered them using the grid fins to catch it, but the booster weighs roughly about 250 tons at this point. Uh, they're planning to make it lighter, but that's insanely heavy. So these lifting lugs were used to hold all of that weight instead, which makes a lot more sense. If you've got these actuating grid fins, those aren't as rigid as something that's going to be built into the structure of it and unmoving. So it makes complete sense. But you know, these lugs needed to fit into a notch in the chopsticks on Mechazilla so that it would be secure. It doesn't slide off or tear the Mechazilla arms off, right? And this adds a whole other complexity to how precise the landing needed to be. And they did it. They shed all that speed from about half the speed of sound and located those lifting lugs into the arms of Mechazilla for the catch. And I'm really hesitant to call it a 100% success because for me as an engineer nothing is ever 100% but it was damn close and I wasn't able to see this in person but I was able to see this on my drive on Sunday which we pulled over for to see the landing we had tears in our eyes as we watched the impossible happen a skyscraper coming back from space being caught by a massive mechanical tower it was just a beautiful example of what space can offer humanity and, and all of us, even just simple human beings going on with their day uh, as they are working on the future here. And it's just a huge thanks and to all the hard work and talent of thousands of people working endless hours to prepare for this moment. Seeing something this amazing and this impossible happen after watching the progress for over five or six years is really hard to describe. Knowing how much work and struggle went into this and how flawlessly they pulled off the first attempt makes me so excited for the future. And I believe we need to see more examples of practically impossible things becoming possible and happening thanks to the hard work and hardcore engineering of a group of very talented individuals. So huge, huge congrats to the SpaceX team and to the Starship teams you know, there's so many people working in different facets of SpaceX. While they, they may cross over, you know, there's the Starlink teams, there's the Falcon 9 teams, the Recovery teams, the Starship teams. They're all working, Crew Dragon teams, right? They're all working on so many different things, and that's probably not even the half of it. But they all put their work together to make this happen. So thank you. You're pushing the boundaries of what's possible for us today for a fantastic future tomorrow. I did have some thoughts after flight test five, so I wanted to put those together here and, and talk about that. And it's, it's a little bit more on how flight test five's success changes the potential future for us moving forward. And this doesn't happen without a dedicated crew of thousands of hands-on technicians working on Mechazilla and the Starship. And that cannot be understated like or it cannot be overstated, that this vehicle that they're building is almost impossible to do for a reason because it requires so much focus and dedication, not to mention hard work 
to fix the things that they figure out along the way. But Starship itself is made of stainless steel, which is a durable and workable material, but it's not the typical metal for spacecraft. You know, you think aluminum, you think titanium for it to be much lighter. But when you have that much thrust and power like you do with Starship, stainless steel can be an amazing material and opportunity for your spacecraft. You know, and SpaceX wants to send uncrewed Starship to Mars during the next transfer orbit, which would be available in 2026. And this catch certainly accelerates this idea. But to make the most of their first attempt in 2026 on Mars, they plan to send up to five, that's right, five uncrewed starships in 2026 to the surface of Mars. This would provide an ample amount of data for the first crewed flight in 2028 because, again, if you can only send something to Mars every two years because of the home and transfer orbit and because it's just too expensive with the amount of fuel, it's just not possible to do it out of that uh, transfer window time. Why not make the most of your two-year window? And so they crazily <laughs> decided to send five. And and while this timeline is very aggressive, it does fit into Elon's classic time estimates, which means we do have to put, you know, a little bit of bonus on there that, you know, even though Elon thinks it's possible, can they get that done uh, in two years? But this catch certainly brings that closer to reality. It's not impossible, and it's more possible now, thanks to the amazing first attempt and successful recovery of the booster. Not to mention another fantastic and accurate sea landing of Starship off the coast of the Indian Ocean, landing right in front of those buoys that they put out there in the landing zone they were looking for. So to me, Starship changes so much about what we think about how we think about the first Mars missions and even lunar missions moving forward. You know, we've got Artemis coming up, Artemis 3. Artemis 2 has to happen next year, where the first uh, U.S. astronauts orbit the moon again since uh, the, the last Apollo mission. And then Artemis 3 would use Starship to land on the moon and bring the crew there. So Starship has taken a huge step forward for not only SpaceX's missions, but for NASA's as well. Now, five starships sent to Mars means potentially five habitats on Mars ready to go and be used by the first humans who step foot on the surface. And if you send supplies on those first Mars missions on these five starships and they survive, you have an incredible opportunity of setting up the first colony on Mars at the same time as the first humans touch down, something that wasn't even in the plans at NASA because... That kind of groundbreaking technology just doesn't exist. Even the mission to the moon, you know, even in the Apollo era, we, we weren't setting up a, a colony or a base on the moon. We were sending a lander each time to the moon. And with how massive Starship is, it provides you the opportunity for this to be a living space, not just the spacecraft. So it really is something special if they're able to pull it off. Starship and its stainless steel design also pushes the need for hands-on expertise because stainless steel is so good to work with and rework and repair. You can, you can weld it, you can work it by hand and with machinery. So, you know, as far as someone who loves hands-on labor, myself, and skilled work with my hands... I'm pretty aware of how necessary, but also underrated it is in the U.S. job market, but even around the world. You know, to me, Starship introduces an incredible opportunity for hands-on skilled workers to be absolutely needed for any Starship mission. Technicians will be necessary for the first century of us traveling to other planets with Starship, and there's nothing there. Wherever, wherever we're going, there's nothing there. We need to build everything once we're there. And so, yes, there, there will be robots eventually, but you can't train a robot to repair a starship that was damaged on flight or on landing, right? You could probably train it to do something routine that you've trained it to do over and over again. It knows, you know, I'm thinking of some weird robot that's able to attach to the side of starship and manipulate, you know, let's say the hull got ripped out a little bit. It's able to manipulate the, the sheet 
but it's got to hold on and and then it's able to apply the force to bend the steel into place to then weld it but if it's not what it trained for it just can't do that so to me starship has the potential to show us once again that hands on skilled labor in the age of ai and automation is very important and i think that's super powerful and and to me it totally changes how you plan a crew for a mission to the moon or mars you know we're we talk a lot about engineering redundancy right having backup systems to the backup systems so that we have one fails you're good to go having a crew with redundant skills and hands-on labor for stainless steel will be absolutely critical for mission success and more importantly for coming back home to earth when the mission is over two years on mars for the orbit to be in the right place again for you to come home so to me the redundancy for crew having skills working with stainless steel is going to become a must as long as progress continues with starship and they're able to keep moving forward and so i'm very very pro starship changing the way that we we think about missions in space and human space travel and they they did an amazing job today making that timeline ever closer to actual reality but also putting a cap on all the hard work that's been done to get starship to this point in its testing on flight test five and we've got so much more to go ahead it's probably going to move faster now which is crazy to think because it's already moving so fast but a huge day for starship for spacex and just for space travel we've gained a huge ability to reuse something as massive as this super heavy booster and this starship system this is the first step they're going to start dialing that in but the fact that they were able to nail the landing both of the super heavy booster getting caught for the first time and starship landing in the indian ocean um we're, we're looking very good for space so wanted to come on and share that here on this monday here october 14th thank you guys have a great rest of your week and we'll be back with some more interviews with some amazing people of space and science but also just anything and all things space so thanks for joining us be well spread love and spread science we'll see you next time on today in space <laughs>